coming up on More Than Before. People would come in and they would be so angry and I would be shocked. Like, I don't understand why they're so angry. I would go in my car sometimes and cry because I was like, I don't know, I don't get it. How do I help them? It became this innate thing that I really wanted to help people, not just with their apartment and not just with their job, but internally. This is More Than Before with Nathan Cook. Hey everyone, welcome back. My guest today, she is an amazing woman who is an encourager, a coach, and a ball of sunshine, all wrapped into one little person. (laughs) She spent 20 years working in the multifamily industry and over 15 years in event planning. She's a powerful singer who can't resist the urge uh, to sing in an echoing hallway and stairwell. So I am excited to have her on today. She has three amazing children who she's taught every single one to drive. So if you live around her, be careful. I don't know what kind of driver she is, but she's got three replicas of her. No, it's probably (laughs) good. (laughs) But I am so blessed to have her on today and to call her my friend, Kiki Clark. Welcome to the show. How are you? Yes. Thank you so much, Nathan. This is going to be great. I am doing amazing and super excited to be here. You know, it's not often I get to meet someone that can match my full energy level. Uh, You know, normally when I have a guest on the show, I kind of have to rein myself in. I have to be careful not to scare them with my, oh my goodness. But with you, I just get to throw off all the blinders, which for all of you listening, I'm very sorry. You're about to see a side of Nathan that you have never seen before. (laughs) So I'm curious, Kiki, before we get too much into the backstory, I would love for you to tell us a little bit, what are you working on right now? What are you excited about in life? Oh my goodness. <laughs> like, do we have, do we have a couple hours? <laughs> yeah, right. I was like, um, okay. Excited about in life. One, everything. I, uh, so I have to tell you, developing people is my favorite thing. And so what I've now found after stepping out completely into my own business is that, I mean, I am working on just branching out that greater influence and reaching clients that I'm people that I've never met before, because when I see them like really blossom in their potential, like I just want to go cry. Like I love it so much. (laughs) I'm like, I was made for this. And so that's actually what I'm working on. I'm putting together a whole, like whole decks for corporate clients, you know, the one-on-ones, the, there's just so many things in how you can develop people into their purpose, potential, life, leadership, job performance, all the things. And it's really fun for me. So I love it. I love that. And you can tell that she's passionate, right? There's people that get on and you're like, oh, I think they might be bad. She's like, you You do not have to guess whether or not Kiki is passionate about what she does. Now, you were, you were born in Missouri, but I think what's interesting is how much you traveled as a child. I'm curious, where, where all did you live? Because you, you were always on the run, it felt like. She wasn't, she wasn't one of those people that was running from the law. No. no she, <laughs> you were traveling a lot with your family. What caused you guys to travel so much? And, and where did you guys end up kind of growing up? Yes. So a lot of people ask if it's military and I, it's not actually my dad was moving for his job. So we, I was born in Missouri. We moved like two weeks later to the Bronx. My brother was born in the Bronx. So my dad was working out there and then it was like a different part, uh, in, in the New York area, moved out to Ohio for a couple years out there, like started, I mean, it was all over the place. And so we didn't really plant to be close to family. We just kind of talked to them from afar and visited them. But then we moved back because then my dad felt a call on his life and he was like, no, I want to go to seminary. So then we were back in New York for him to go to seminary. And I, I don't know if we have time to go into that story, but the Lord really told them where to go. And so we traveled from New York to Grand Junction, Colorado in a station wagon, okay, and another car and a huge, you know, moving trailer and with a dog, a cat, and a rabbit um, to plant a church. So that's where we actually ended up. I tell people I'm from Grand Junction, Colorado, because that was eighth grade up. And I basically told my parents when we got there, 
I don't care if you move again. I'm going to finish school here. <laughs> I'm going to stay here. You are not taking me like, with you. This is not okay. You know, I'm like <laughs> moving around from schools. I didn't. So, but, but it was great. We, we uh, started a church out there and I was able to stay and finish high school out there and then came, came to tech. Well, I did go to California for a year and then came to Texas. <laughs> Yeah, and then you escape really quickly with no. burning off of your clothes. Oh, I got to get out of here. <laughs> so what I'm, I'm curious, how old were you when you uh, moved from New York to Colorado? So I, I think it was 12. I think I was going into the eighth grade and not quite a teenager yet. One of the fascinating right. pieces about your story was your relationship of, of when you accepted Christ, mm. you know, there, there, are, there are people that accept Christ when they're, you know, old and gray and maybe in their teens or, you know, they've, they've gone through some life and Kiki had definitely gone through some life when she decided to accept Jesus in her heart. I don't know what she was doing. She was definitely a wretched sinner. You could tell my wife and I were talking about you last night. And, and one of the things she was like, I'm, I'm really curious about how perceptive she was to be able to accept Jesus at that point. I'm curious, have you always kind of been an old soul, like very perceptive about what's going on around you? I believe so. I have some older friends. I, I love like just older mentors, things like that. So, so yes, and that, and that was an incredible story. My parents, so my mom is Jewish and my dad is Catholic and they decided to get married. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and then my parents, when I was probably about, I want to say th three or four, my brother might have been three and I might have been four, and we went, my parents attended a Jews for Jesus. So it explained the Passover and it explained Jesus and they missed it because my brother and I, there was some section in there we were, you know, fussing or something and my mom missed some and so she went and asked them if they would come over and explain it. So when they had come over, they accepted Jesus through that. And then we started going to like a local church. And then that's, yes, when my mom, I was just sitting there in the kitchen. She said I was five years old. I was sitting in the kitchen. She was cooking. And then I said, you know, does everybody go to heaven? And she was like, no, you know, you need to accept Jesus in your hand. And, and she didn't even prompt me nothing. And I was like, Jesus, you know, please come into my heart. And then like I'd said my own prayer. And she was like. <laughs> so, Kiki, <laughs> five years old. I'm. I just. I. The Lord was that close, and I was like, "Okay, you have, you know, created me, set me on a path from birth, and will not let me maneuver away from that." <laughs> I love that so much. It 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 kind of reminds me a little. Our daughter, she's five, uh, and she turns she turned six in what six months. And it's so funny because Willow, my wife, she was driving them to gymnastics and same conversation, was pretty much same conversation. Uh, you know, mom, are we going to die? Am I going to die? And I'm like, well, you know, if you accept Jesus into your heart, she's like, do you, do you want to do that? And she said, yeah, I do. She said to my wife, she said, um, just a moment, mom. She bowed her head and she's in the back and she's praying. You know, my wife's driving, so she's not like paying attention to what's oh, going on I back there. She's yeah. like, okay, are, are you, are you ready? And she's like, oh, I just did it, mom. <laughs> she, does, she doesn't even need mom. So it, there, that's just so, that's so cool uh, that you had that awareness to be able to do that at that point. But yeah. then I'm also curious. So a year later, so you were five at that point, And then uh, when you turned six, now all of a sudden you went from the firstborn oldest okay. first position Oh, yeah. To the middle child. How does that happen? <laughs> then what was the dynamic shift for mm -hmm. you going from the oldest child, which everyone looks as kind of like the token, you know, we're going to make all of our mistakes on this one, let them go, to the middle child, which most people forget in society, right? How did, yeah. how did that dynamic work? Oh, yeah. I love filling out that question and giving the answer. The firstborn, only girl, middle child. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, what? So when my parents got saved, they were really radical. They were at the church and they were like, okay, Lord, what do you want us to do? And this local community that we were in, in Ohio at that point, had a boy that needed to be adopted. Mm. And so what happened was his mother had him and then had twins after him and decided to keep the twins and gave him up for adoption. And my parents were like, oh, no, 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 
we're, we're going to we're going to take him in. And so he was 6. <laughs> So he came into the household and we had just, an, a, you know, the normal loving family. And he, he just, he came from a background of, you know, you know, being rejected, being that oldest just given away for, you know, just so she could keep the twins. It was, it was very interesting dynamic. And actually, I don't, I don't remember all of that at age five, but um, I remember, you know, just we accepting him and it was all good until like the puberty years. <laughs> and then when we got there, it was like uh, he just from his background and all of that. And they, it was it was just a, a constant like growth area for my parents. And uh, it was just very interesting. And he, he wasn't able to stay in, you know, the high school. He couldn't stay in his classes. He, he had just things because, you know, when you're in the first ages you know age zero to six that's when you learn all of those attachments so we brought him on after that and so it was an interesting dynamic in the teenage years of just maneuvering through that and he's doing really well right now way better than he ever has but uh it, it did get interesting in the middle there <laughs> <laughs> so who were you as a child like if if we were to wrap kiki up who is who is kiki growing up as a kid kiki was the strong-willed uh, the strong-willed one, as my mom would put it. If I, she, she tells some stories about, you know, I really wanted to wear the red overalls and she was like, no, you can't wear these today or whatever. Or, or she said at one point she had shut the door to the car and I just started screaming. Okay. And she was like, what happened? She thought my hand was in the door, but she realized I wanted to shut the door to the car. So this is my strong will uh, personality that started to come out. But then it was, okay, you know, how can I be self-sufficient? I became the mm. self-sufficient one, you know, uh, with, with them having to take care of my older brother and kind of maneuver through that. My younger brother is only 14 months younger than me. And so we, we really connected, but a lot of his friends were my friends and cause we were kind of close there, you know, but that was me. That was the, all right, um, my mom really pushed for those good grades. Like, you get the 95, like, why didn't you get the 99 <laughs> type of situation? <laughs> We've talked about it, so it's okay if she listens to this. <laughs> she was a good Jewish mother. You could tell. <laughs> he, he was on me. So, so you know, I, I was in a lot of extracurricular activities, you know, choir, show choir, theater, band, all the things. And cheerleading track, like all of it. I just wanted to try it all. And that was me. Yeah. Well, and I love how you, you kind of rolled through the singing part pretty quickly because you, you were actually with the Continental Singers, which is not, not really a small thing. Uh, yeah. pretty, pretty well-known gospel choir. What role did that play in kind of shaping who you were? Because you, like, yeah, you hear Kiki traveling around. Uh, but then all of a sudden now she's in a choir and she's traveling around all over the world. Yes. You're like, I don't think most people have even dreamed about as many places as you traveled to in the world. How did that play a part in shaping who you are? Oh, wow. Yes. And yes, I think I've been in 48 States <laughs> and I, uh, I think it's, I don't know if it's 11 countries or something like that, that I've written down, but for that particular moment, I was 16 and I was like, I want to go on the Continental Singer singing group, gospel singing group tour. And my mom was like, okay, we're going to raise some funds for that. And I really prayed about which tour. So we chose the Fiji and New Zealand tour. And this, it was so funny because I, when I chose this one, you know, usually they go and they have the choir, but no, the time Kiki goes, there were we're actually acting out the story of Joseph, okay? <laughs> and so when we go to this like boot camp to learn our parts and who's gonna do what, because so, so the first part of the presentation was the story of Joseph and then we would go change and come back, we'd have the gospel message and then we'd sing and you know, have like an altar call. Okay, no, but, <laughs> and I do love to sing. So I tried out for the Potiphar's wife, you know, like, why not? And I mean, it was hilarious. I loved it. 
I loved every moment of it because then every time we would perform at these churches, like every night or every other day, because we would travel, you know, all over the States before we went overseas and, and did this. And so, you know, that scene would come and it was just me kind of being like, okay, let me see if I can get Joseph to sin <laughs> in this musical, you know, presentation. But it brought a lot of humor and reality to the situation. And it just, it was really fun. But to answer your question, that is actually where I met my first husband, my ex-husband now, which goes into that whole story of my life there. But on that trip was uh, the first time I met him. So I was 16 years old and he was just like, I'm going to marry you. And I was like, this is a Christian man. He loves Jesus, you know, and he was a musician. And I was like, okay, this could work. This could work. So I'm sure we'll go there in a second. But that is actually where I met him. And so, you know, I That's got three fascinating. kids out of that. So you get back. How old were you when you finished doing the Continental Singers? 16. Uh, what happens after high school? So I, I really wanted to get married. And so my mom and dad, well, I don't know if it was both of them, but my mom definitely said that I needed to be 20 years old and go to a year of college before I got married <laughs> because I had been now together kind of a little off and on about four years with uh, my ex-husband that I had met on the Continental Singers. And so I was like, okay, awesome. So I had applied for the schools to where my dad was a pastor in the denomination so I could get like a scholarship. So mm -hmm. I chose one in California. I went for a year, <laughs> came back, worked and got married. And moved now, to we're, Texas. now we're not, now we know why she went to California <laughs> just to get that out of the way. So we come back and get married. Yep. I loved it. I was, I, I really liked the school. It was fun and I, I could have stayed there longer, but I just really was focused on, I want to, I want to get married and go into the ministry. Oh my gosh. That is so funny. You end up getting married and then what, what happens career wise for you at that point? So my husband at the time was in ministry and so I just joined him in ministry. So mm. there was like income by faith, <laughs> no house, no apartment. I was the one with the car. It was a very interesting moment of my life, and I just went all in. Like, you know, being 20 years old, let's try it. I'm not sure people do that at, you know, 40s or 50s, but, you know, it could happen at any time. Yeah. I feel like I'm kind of revisiting that. <laughs> <laughs> life is cyclical sometimes. <laughs> you know, it's, it is a journey of faith. So yeah. that one, I really jumped in. I really jumped in. So I didn't have a career per se. It mm. was, okay, we're going to be in the ministry. We are going to serve in some churches. And we were actually living with his aunt and uncle at the time. So what took you into the multifamily industry then? Uh -huh. So in being in ministry for years of that, there, you know, churches would just not pay us, you know, cause they didn't have income or things like that. And I was like, this is getting crazy. We eventually had at one point we had four apartments and like 15 people in our ministry and having to pay for all that. It was very interesting, but we then, uh, kind of shifted into our own apartment with our, th our three kids then at the time. So that was all during that. And I had tried a little bit of entrepreneurship, which I, when I think back, I thought, Oh, this has always been in me right here. You know, trying to make a little extra money. I literally made tooth fairy pillows for toddlers, <laughs> toddler bed, like comforters and, and stuff like that. Like I was just trying anything and it's because I'm very crafty, but we were living in this apartment community and I had gone in and I would always bring my kids in. And this lady who was there to do the event, she just, she wasn't showing up on time. And I, I was there and she was like, you should give Kiki the job. And I was like, oh, I can work on the weekends, bring my kids. Sure. Absolutely. I will take it. And you know, cause it was just like, I made my own schedule and I lived there too. So that was the door in. And then three months later, the supervisor was like, she needs to work in the office. And so they made me an offer and I was like, I uh, didn't ever think working full time because I'm a mom now, right? Yeah. Like, you know, my, my girls were going into kindergarten pre-K at the time and my son was almost going into pre-K. So he was going to, you know, not be there. So I thought, hmm, well, we really need the money. So yes, <laughs> that's how I got in. Seriously. I, it, 
That's the truth. That's the truth. Nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> so I needed I lo- money. And they didn't teach me anything. I didn't know what to wear. I didn't know what I was doing. They were just like, I'm hiring on attitude. My manager quit four days later. Like I was like, oh, this is fun. You know what I love about this? I was just having this conversation with a friend of mine uh, just like a couple hours ago. And I was, I was talking to him and I was saying, you know, one of the things that people kind of miss is when God is calling you into things, we always think, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I, I got to. And then, and then we try to put on a facade to get the position or get the thing that we feel like we're supposed to be doing. And we were, we were having this conversation and he was telling me about this new opportunity that just opened up. He's, he's praying about it. He thinks this is where God is calling him. And as he was describing how he got it, it was, it was quite literally that someone said, we had a really great interaction. We liked you. And he was like, I wasn't even nice at that point. Like I was having a bad day, (laughs) but just who you are, if you live as who you are, it creates opportunities, doors open up, but you do have to be open eyed to see those opportunities. I'm curious, Kiki, what were some of the opportunities that maybe you look back on life now and you go, man, my eyes were closed to that opportunity, man, I missed a great opportunity right here. But later on down the road, maybe because you missed that opportunity, something else also came to fruition, something else kind of bloomed in your life. Immediately what comes to mind is when I had gone to this, this church that I had attended for like nine years when I started there. You know, people were like, oh, why don't you come to this group or why don't you come to this group or help us in in this? And I, I think if I would have said yes to some of that, I wouldn't be where I am right now. Mm. And so I don't know that I would call it a missed opportunity. I, I, would, I was looking at it like, dang, like I should have gone and been a part of that. But then I realized, no, it was time for me to really invest in my kids during that moment instead of just being out there, you know, like helping other kids. Like I had to get my kids to adulthood first, you know, uh, cause I'm acts of service. So I could like be doing a ton of things and you know, just my cup gets full. Right. Yeah. I think that. And then also when I started this company, Vibrant Life Coaching in 2021, I really believe I thought, I thought that I was supposed to go full time then. And I'm glad that I didn't because in recent months, I have realized that if I would have done that, then my audience would have been mainly women because my Mm -hmm. business coaches at the time were really telling me like, this is what you should do. Like your audience should be women and something didn't sit right with me. And then over the past couple of months, I have uh, just really listened to the Lord received some incredible prophetic strong words that's men and women you know i mean i am a developer of all people and so i think like to answer your question like i would have been in the wrong lane Mm. and so i really feel like right now i'm in the right lane i love that it's so good you have such a natural optimism about you every time i've seen you since the first time i met you we were we were at a maxwell conference and I met you and I was like, who is this gal? Like she, she just walks in and she's like this bright sun walking around. And you're like, this can't be real. Like what, <laughs> kind of like what we were talking about earlier. Yeah. But she's 100% real. This is, this is the Kiki uh, yes. that, that shows up all the time. I'm curious, where does that optimism come from? And mm. I'm curious, how do you balance that optimism? Because sometimes mm. our optimism can become a a distortion to other people that people can't actually see uh, past who you actually are because you are so bright, right? So where does that come from? And and how do you overcome that brightness factor that you carry with you? (laughs) I love this question. Okay, okay. I really think it's a spiritual gift, you know, for starters, because you know, back when we were talking about when I was 16, I was going around to all these churches because I was like, there's got to be more. The Holy Spirit's doing something. There's prophetic. And this one woman, like probably the first time I think I'd heard anyone prophesy over me. And she was like, it's your smile. It's a permanent smile. Like the Lord has given you joy. And I was like, that's right. You know, and it like clicked and it's never, it's never left. Even during all the, the trauma of, uh, this, the family dynamics that happened, it, it really is something that stayed. And I believe that it's foundational and I don't, 
I don't move from it because I know that I am a child of the living God Mm -hmm. and no one can take that from me. And so I feel like that is just a spiritual gift that I have been given. Now, the funny part about all of that is, you know, when people hear my story, they're like, what? You're like, how, how are you happy? And then, but like in my 20 year career, I had five different presidents. Like I held eight titles and I had five different presidents and at least two of them, most likely three of them. But specifically, I remember going in and when it was their first day and I'm like, hi, like I scared them. And so I was like, I had to, I was like, this is okay. I need to, how do I maneuver this? like my new boss for saying I'm scaring them on the first day. It was a joke to one of my bosses that I call boss and and we talk all the time. We're friends. She, uh, she came to work over me for a season so that she could, you know, kind of grow in the company. Mm -hmm. And she, she would send me these memes about big bird and about in the morning, like this is Kiki. Big bird in the morning because it was just so real. She was like, This person is really legit. She doesn't drink coffee and or caffeine. Like it's this is just an innate energy that the Lord has given me. And so I have had to learn to dial it back so that I don't scare people up front because they just really are are shocked by it. I I think until I got into multifamily, until I decided to take the job and have a career, I really didn't understand that people weren't as excited about things as I was. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and I, it was funny when I would do onboarding and tell my story, I would say, okay, these people would come in and they would be so angry and I would be just so shocked. Like, I don't understand why they're so angry. And I would go in my car sometimes and cry because I was like, I don't know. I don't get it. How do I help them? And so and it, 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 it became this innate thing that I really wanted to help people, not just with their apartment and not just with their job, but internally. And that's mm. how I grew into this coaching, developing, because I was like, there it is. There it is. No, no, no. Because we're made for this. Nathan, we are made for f- to have an exciting life like that's one of my taglines life is exciting mm-hmm. because so much of it is just mundane and we're doing this and we have to work because we have to pay bills and we have to do all these things but it's our perspective yeah. and if we can change that oh my goodness we can love everything about our day i mean everything <laughs> This is so amazing. So what is the power of a name? Like calling someone by their name. Why is that important? The power in a name. Ooh, that could be so much. Woo, let me let me pick a lane there. Uh, the power in a name. Let's just take an example. I mean, yes, we're, we're given a name. Okay, so like my name, Kiki. Double happiness. Double portion, baby. <laughs> when we were in Ohio, way back when I was little, I had a pastor tell me that my name meant key to heaven and the key to your heart. Mm. And I just thought that was really neat. And so like in the coaching, I have a key in my logo because I want to unlock doors for people. Like I want to unlock their potential, their purpose, their passion, their excitement in life, right? That is my calling for sure, destiny. And so yes, in the name, there it is. Like my parents were going to call me Nicole, call me Nikki and they came out with Kiki and they were, everyone's like, wow, that just totally fits you. And I'm like, yep. And what's great is it's K I K I not K E K I. And everyone thinks I'm black, which is <laughs> awesome. Okay. Like I, the, the last time I took a flight, I went up to the Southwest counter and it was a black woman in there and I handed her my ID and she was like, is this, this is your real name? And I was like, and I'm a white girl. Huh? And she was like, this made my day. It I'm telling you, and I'm saying this because I worked at a lot of communities and we had so many like residents and they would talk to me on the phone, but when they would come and see me, they they would jump. So not only am I excited, but I'm a different color <laughs> than expected. <laughs> awesome. I absolutely love it. <laughs> I love that so much because there is so much importance in a name. It's mm-hmm. so funny because you know we're having we're having our fourth child here coming up here at the end of the year, which is crazy and exciting, and we're gonna be drowning even more. No, you're gonna be flourishing in the flourishing. Quiver. Yeah, yeah, that is very true. Good point. 
But one of the things uh, that has always been so challenging to us is the name, mm. is finding a name that will do your child justice in terms of prophetic meaning. Mm. And we've done this with every single child. Mm. And so it's so interesting to me that your name, Kiki, double portion, uh, you know, and I was, I was even looking it up, double portion of happiness. It's yep. double happiness. And mm. you see this written all over her. She comes into a room, super happy. But you know what's really interesting is the people that have a double portion of something, the people mm. that are massively blessed in one area, they don't just keep it for themselves. They're constantly distributing that to others. I see that specifically with you in the work that you do with the people that you're constantly you. working with. Yeah. Now, I also find it really interesting that you can find really, really bright people in the world. And I think sometimes we forget that there is a darkness mm. that comes sometimes with that bright demeanor. Mm. And you've definitely gone through some dark times in your life. And if you're willing, I would love to kind of go into that a little yeah. bit of some of the darkness that you had to walk through and who you became in the darkness and who you came out as as yes. you came back into the light. Now, let me ask you this question, though. I know this is not in our notes, but I really feel like I should ask you this because it's going to be funny when I give you my answer. If I asked you, Nathan, like, what is your superpower? Like, what is your name for your superpower? What would you say? Like, if you had a superpower and you would name it or that that would be your, like, you know, like Wonder Woman. Okay, that's not you, but I'm just saying, <laughs> like, the name. How does you I'm know? Talking, <laughs> we're talking about names, yeah. right? Yeah. So what would you say is yours? Just off the top of your head. Man, the, honestly, mine goes to an actual superhero, uh, right. which was which is Superman. Okay. Um, Superman, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't think I've ever thought about that, of what what would Nathan's superpower be? And it's, I think it's presence. Presence. It's, pre it's presence, uh, which actually works really well with my name, because my name means gift of God. So yeah. I think my superpower is presence. Uh, not just giving, but in the actual presencing of yes. a situation of being somewhere. I love that you answered that. It came to mind. See, because I had a great leader ask me this question. And I was like, what? And all of a sudden, Sun Pal. I was like, my superhero is Sun Pal. Because <laughs> it's like when I walk into the room, <laughs> that's Sun. what happens. It changes the, it changes the dynamic. And I've learned that over the years, as long as I'm being myself, mm. okay, that's the key. If I walk in and I don't know what I'm doing or I just like am weirded out or nervous or whatever, like, and that's, so it's very important that I take that self-care, take that self-leadership and do that so that when, like when I go into these corporate workshops and these spaces and presenting, and I don't even know any of these people, that's what happens though is like something shifts in the room. When you asked about the name, that's just what came to mind is the superhero name because everyone can think of it for themselves. And even if they don't feel like it's them in that moment, they can become that. Yeah. You know, this is so good. But yes, I'm ready to dive in all the drama. <laughs> yeah, all the drama. Buckle your seatbelts. We're it's about to no, get yeah, bumpy. Yeah, buckle this up. It's not. It's gonna. Ladies and gentlemen, you. please fasten your seatbelts. The seatbelt <laughs> sign has been illuminated above your heads. Be prepared for all kinds of crazy things that may ensue following Kiki's response. Yeah. <laughs> so, tell us a little bit about kind of the dark times. And in fact, I think what's interesting is it didn't start that way, right? No. It, no. It just progressed in that way. Yes. And in my book that I wrote about this, it literally, it, this could happen to anyone. So you open the door to the enemy, like you, one little lie and you keep doing it and you keep doing it. It's the scripture, you know, then chaos, you open the door to chaos basically. And so my ex-husband, so we, you know, we got married, we went into the ministry, we had three kids, I started working, you know, all that's happening. Well, dun 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 dun. He decided to slowly make decisions that were not healthy and not godly. Mm. And so in that, he was dabbling with some drugs. And I, I, okay, let me explain. I am a developer at heart. So when I took the StrengthsFinder like, survey or whatever, and the top one is developer, let me explain what it says in there. It says, you 
see the potential in people even to a fault. Like that is my innate ability. So so in all this, I, I read that way after all this trauma. And I was like, no wonder. <laughs> we found out what soul piles weakness is. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes. So in this, I'm always looking at the positive. I'm always having that hope. I'm like, okay. And so while he's going through this and he's starting to have this midlife crisis, he starts, he, he chose another woman, uh, multiple. <laughs> and I don't find out right away. I know that something's off, but I, I trust. I trust until you've given me a reason not to. You know, and, and I just give everybody that up front, like, like straight on. And so when it started to turn and I found out about that, I actually, it was craziness. So I won't even go into that, but it was craziness. And so then I filed for divorce and we separated for about eight months. And then I really just felt like, okay, God, you know, I really feel like I need to cancel this and try to reconcile. Okay, great. The only problem with that is I didn't have a coach telling me how to have healthy boundaries in some in some situation that's completely chaotic, okay? <laughs> completely chaotic, which again is another reason why I wrote the book. So when he he came back and and the kids were like junior high and so it was like so amazing for them to have their dad back and there was all that dynamic, but man, you talk about walking hell like mm-hmm. We like trying to reconcile, going to counseling and, and trying to like figure out how to communicate after that and heal from all that was, I don't, I don't wish it on anybody. Okay. Nobody. And it's just like, just be honest with your spouse. <laughs> just tell them I'm, I'm cheating on you. I know that sounds strange, but it is like way better to have all of the information instead of find out information like. Piece by piece. Yeah, that that's not fun at all for anybody. And so uh, we went through some counseling, things like that. Things were things were better a little bit, and then he uh, he really hit another wall about a midlife crisis, and then started drinking heavily, uh, dabbling with some like prescription medication with alcohol. And when I tell you that I tried, like it. My friends were like, you are, you get an A plus. Okay. It's time for you to go now. Cause I am a strong believer, you know, and I am like, Lord, I know you didn't create divorce as a thing. You did create it. Let me reword that. Yeah. He had like the Lord divorced Israel for their actions. Okay. So divorce was a thing, but it's not something that the Lord says, Oh yeah, I like divorce. That's what I, that's what I mean. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so I was really, really trying and what happened while he was under the influence is he would just consistently start yelling at me about things. Like I had no idea. It would be two hours of him just yelling at me. And let me tell you that when it happens over time like that, your body starts to like adjust to it and get used to it. Okay. And you, you start surviving. So fast forward as he's doing this, my like he'll, he would just start yelling and my body would start shaking. And I was like, that's weird. And it, it was to the point where I wasn't able to like remember full phone numbers, zip codes. And I was having to write everything down. And I was like, why am I having to do this? And so I was talking through it with a friend. I went to a counseling session and of course I was providing and I was the one getting, making the money at the time. So this counselor looked at me and said, if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. I feel like that's a feel like that's a biblical principle there. Yeah, and so I looked at him and I was like, "Oh, interesting." Because I'm thinking all these biblical principles of forgive, hope, pray, you know, and which mm-hmm. is what I was getting from the church as well. You yeah. know, like no, you know, you can you can make this work. And I had to have an intervention. And from there, I just I felt I I let that second file for divorce go through for safety reasons. He was trying to climb in the windows of the house. Oh Lord, it was. It was a mess, y'all. Mm. From there, I started a journey of four years of healing groups, which were incredible. I was very angry. My mom actually, from afar, she didn't even live in the same state. She was like, you need to go to celebrate recovery. And I was like, whatever, I am angry. And so I was like, fine, you know, honor your father and mother. So I go, I will never forget this. This is like the funniest moment. 
I walk in because I don't like to be angry, but I mean, there was just like so much, you know. And by the way, I have to tell you, nobody really knew at work what was going on. It was weird. It was like how I survived. Like I went to work and I was like my nice, normal, happy self. But then going home was just like, ah, you know, just really walking through that and uh, being in these groups. So when I had walked into the Celebrate Recovery moment, I walked up to this this one, woman and she was like, hi. And this, she did it so well. What we were talking about, about having that right, matching the energy. Okay, she walks up to me and she she's not in front of me. She's beside me. We're looking the same way. And she's like, is this your first time here? And I was like, yeah. And, and she's like, well, what brought you here? And I said, you know, I am really angry. And my, uh, my ex-husband has cheated on me. And, the, and I just went and she's like, you'll find others here. And I was like, what is wrong with this woman? <laughs> Did she not hear me? And so it was awesome though, because Celebrate Recovery is not just for people who are dealing with addiction, but it's for the spouse as well. And I found just the safest space to just talk and mm. share what was I was going through. And so I was, my brain was able to start healing and actually thinking and feeling again and, and really connect to the inner me, not the working me, the inner me that really needed the healing. And so from there, I was in multiple groups. I actually was cleared by a whole health doctor about being healed emotionally, physically, spiritually, in all of the areas, you know, uh, just after that journey. And that's why I, I have some philanthropy. I help women walk through that, you know, whether their relationship is healed and their marriage success, or they have to get divorced, either one, it's up to them, you know, and it's all in, you know, wh what's going on. Every, every relationship is different. There are certain similarities, <laughs> but yeah, and that's that's just kind of in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the, that's a quick you know top of the waves kind of piece. Yes, and, but like kind of like what you were saying, like no one knew at work what was going on, and I think what's really interesting, and I'm and I'm going to ask the question, and I'm just going to let you go full bore on this because yeah. this is this is this is a frustration that I have that I've experienced throughout my life, um, not just personally, but what I've seen for other people. But, uh, and I've, I've actually heard it put this way really well, especially people that have gone to celebrate recovery and AA and all that stuff is essentially that more people will find grace at celebrate recovery or an AA meeting than they will when they walk into a church. And yeah. that is something that you had to wrestle with in terms of community people, people that you knew for a long time, people that know you, that you probably had in your house that all of a sudden are flipping their script because of a situation where you actually needed to go through this for your own safety, for your own mental, uh, you know, mental being, for your own soul. How did you walk through that? Mm. Ooh, that's like a soapbox question. Ooh. Okay, y'all. When he did, like you just said, people that I had in my house. So I had people come and sit in my house and try to convince me to not get a divorce. I mean, sit all day, like they wouldn't leave my house. And I'm like, what is wrong with you people? Do you have any clue what happens here? They don't know because the drama was in the house. You could not see it when we went somewhere. You know, like, it, like counselors had to really figure out what was going on because it's so hidden. Mm -hmm. And so that, and then, I mean, even from my in-laws, like shunned. That because, I mean, he, and he was a pastor and he, it was just like, oh, I can't believe she chose that. She gave up. And I was mm. like, hold up. <laughs> I don't think you understand what really is happening in this house. And like, that's why I feel for people who are, they, they'll, women will call me and say, this is what the church is saying. Just keep praying, keep hoping. And what happens is you end up in that hope deferred makes the heart sick and your heart actually becomes sick. Mm -hmm. And that is a, not a place that the Lord wants us to stay in. I could say so much on that subject, but the church has come so far in realizing that what's happening in the hidden places is not good for people to be able to be in their identity and their purpose that the Lord created them. And we only live once and divorce isn't like this identity. It's mm. ridiculous how it becomes this identity. And that's come down from like all 
like Catholicism. I mean, that could go way, way back, right? Yeah. But, yeah. but the church sees it as like an unforgivable sin, almost like smoking. It's the weirdest thing, but it's a religious spirit that's mm -hmm. on the church. And if you really look into the scripture, the Lord did create divorce in instances that it needed to happen. You know, I mean, not that we all want that for people. We don't want, you know, your hearts to become hard. We don't want to grieve through like the process and have that whole split of the household. But you have got to remain healthy. You have got to remain who you are. You do not control your spouse's choices or anything like that. And neither should the church control choices. The Lord doesn't even control our choices. It's our choice to follow him. You know, and so it's so backwards. It is, I mean, I have the goosebumps. It is so backwards. And it is definitely something that I have, I'm very passionate of talking about and walking people through. Yeah. And I think it's huge because as community, as people in the church, we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware of every single person that walks in. You know, I was, I was hearing recently of a story of a, of a pastor. He, he just became the uh, head pastor, true story, head pastor of a, of, a, of a large church. He walked in the Sunday that he was supposed to be coming in. No one knew who he was. None of the elders knew who he was. He, he walked in and he was dressed as a homeless person. Um, he smelled and he went around and people, people were trying to get him out the door. Mm -hmm. They were following him. And so service starts, like no one, no one greeted him, not even the staff at the church. Service started, they went through worship and he came from the back of the room. He was in the back and he walked all the way up to the front of the room. He stood at the pulpit and he said, I'm the new pastor. Today's sermon is on judgment. And then he stepped off the pulpit and he walked off. And you know, every single person in that room was convicted right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when we talk about the darkness that we have in our lives, that we all have something somewhere that wants to be dark, right? And we have to shine light on that. Yeah. And illuminance is one of the, the mandatory pieces that we need for any kind of healing in life. Mm -hmm. There's such a powerful piece to that. And there's so much that we can learn, not just the church, but everyone in general. There's so many great things that the church does. So don't hear us wrong with that because we, we love the church. Yes. We love Jesus. And it's the, these, these strongholds that the church has about it, and it, it, it weaves into identity, and it's that's just all not right. It's not true. Yeah, yeah. So I want to do a small shift here because we're yeah. getting to the we're t getting to our time. But there was a period uh, of life, actually still ongoing, from what I understand, in your life of mission trips. Oh, I love them. Yeah, I know you love them because every year you go on a mission trip, um, which is really amazing because I think that, you know, always think, oh, we're going on a mission trip and we're going to help these people. And honestly, when we get there, we are transformed. Mm -hmm. Our lives are changed. It's such a crazy experience. And I wanted to ask you, as I, as I talk about mission, missionary work, as you go off and you do some missionary work somewhere, what experience comes to mind and how did that experience transform who you are today by going somewhere and serving someone that would never have the opportunity to repay you for anything that you did? You know, I think it's my oldest daughter and I went to Haiti with core love and... <laughs> That was exhausting. It was incredibly amazing and hot and exhausting. I love that they didn't, you know, sometimes when you go on a mission trip, you have to have special clothes. You know, us in the States, we can wear whatever we want here. But, you know, sometimes when you go into other cultures, you have to, you know, wear different things. But on this particular one, even though we were in Haiti, because we were going from our like guest house that we were in, straight to this orphanage and back like they were like they didn't care shorts and tank tops were our thing i mean it was so hot outside but let me tell you that we went every day to this orphanage 75 kids and i think there was 10 house mamas watching these 75 kids all orphans staying in this place they had different rooms for them with bunk beds in there they were painted different and we basically relieved the mamas for the day and we're able to play with the kids on this one like boat playground thing that they had in the middle. 
was like no grass. It was just just in there and because they had to keep the kids, you know, in a safety area. So, you know, there's the gates in there and we would uh, just be there, help serving them eat. And I mean, incredible. It was so cute though, because they were like, you don't need to let them have your phones and stuff. And here's my daughter over here and they're all on her phone. <laughs> Like it was hilarious. We we just it was exhausting. So then we would go back to the house. We would take a nap and go back, and we served them. I think brownies and pizza one night, which was awesome. And and then I led us in a like a Jericho story, and we had we had uh, put a bunch of like red cups up, like a you know like the walls are coming down or whatever, and they we let them run through them. It was hilarious, but just to bring them joy and ah. Uh, you know, relief for the actual mamas that help them every single day. Like mm. 75 kids. Can you imagine that? Like, I mean, teaching them to, and of all ages. Like, I think it was infant to like 11, maybe? Mm. Infant to, to 10 or so like that. It was, that was incredible. That's amazing. I love that so much. You know, Kiki, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. There's so much wisdom. There's so many great things that you've shared with us. I hope that you guys go back, listen to this over and over and over again. I do have one more question for you, but before I ask it, all of you listening right now, take a moment, go follow Kiki Clark and learn more about what she is doing. There is so much going on in her world. There's so many great things that you can get plugged into of learning. She is an amazing coach. She's such a great encourager, as you've heard and as you've experienced. She is a bright light. One of the things you're going to love is you're going to love her book. Uh, she, she has an amazing book. Go check it out. It's going to be in the show notes here. Uh, Kiki, we've, we, it's kind of come up a couple times as we've been talking, but it's this idea of loving people. There are people in our life that are just hard to love sometimes. Mm. And I'm curious, what have you learned about yourself in learning to love your neighbor? What does that mean for you to love your neighbor? And how does that show up in someone's life that maybe is listening right now where they, we say, you know, go love your neighbor. And they're like, well, I don't really want to go over next door. We're not just talking about that neighbor. But what does it look like for you to love your neighbor? And how would you encourage someone that's listening right now to love their neighbor where they are? This is good. And immediately what comes to mind, people, people are shocked when I say this because I tell them, you know, the Lord loves me as much as he loves my ex-husband. The Lord has a purpose for me as much as he does for him. And they're like, well, how, how can you say that? Listen, <laughs> forgiveness is so powerful. And really, I know throughout this, we've talked about perspective mm -hmm. and that is the, that is the true perspective, no matter what happened. I mean, my ex-husband apologizes to me all the time. <laughs> no, he's like, I cannot believe I did that. It's, it's okay. You know, it happened. It's a circumstance that happened that I realized I'm not going to control it. Right. And so in that, in all my healing, looking at the mirror and forgiving the woman that he was sleeping with, you know, because that's a whole story in itself as well. And the Lord really healing me where I can say her name and I have absolutely no like hard feeling toward her or anything because I know her very well, you know, and then just saying her name and just knowing the same thing. The Lord loves her as much as he loves me, has a plan for her life, has uniquely gifted her with a purpose. I mean, we are going to be in heaven together no matter what their choices were. And that's okay because I'm going to be worshiping Jesus, not worried about whether you slept with him or not. Do you know what I'm saying? Like just really getting the perspective of heaven and not having the perspective of earth. This is not all that we have for our lives. Like we're going to be together worshiping the King. And so I would encourage just how to love well, let go of the crap. Mm -hmm. Like don't hold on to it. It's going to make you look younger. <laughs> it's going to make you feel better. You're going to live a life that is exciting and passionate because you're not holding on to all that stuff in your inner, inner workings. It gets in your soul. It gets in your spirit. It gets in your immune system like let it go you know and and just know that you have a purpose for your life like there's a plan for you no matter what it looks like right this minute 
there is a plan for it, you know, and I know when you're in that trauma moment, when people look at you and say, now all things work together for the good of those who love him. You're like, I need you to shut up right now. You know, like I get that, like, cause there are those moments where you just need people to shut up and just listen. Like they don't need to tell you what to do. And so it's okay if you're in that moment. And if you are just know, I am a walking testimony that it will pass. That season isn't forever. That's why there are seasons. And don't let go of Jesus because he is your rock, your foundation, and he won't let you go. He never leaves you. He's always there through all that. I mean, I could go on and on about where he was in all those moments. But, you know, y'all can connect with me. And I can tell you all of that. (laughs) And she will. And she will pour into you just as much as she poured into you today. Man, this has been such an amazing time. Kiki, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, I know that so many are benefiting from what you just said, especially what you just said right there. So to all of you listening, make sure you like this episode. Make sure you share it with a friend. And until next time, remember to be more, see more, and experience more than before.